Yesterday, we spent the bulk of our time on introduction and on the picture of the church as the body of Christ of which he is the head. And the particular point of that picture was to demonstrate not only unity, but a unity which produces order. So when you look at the human frame, you see tremendous order. You see a unity and you see an order out of that unity. And the same thing is to be true in the church. God expects that there will be order in the church. In fact, when Paul writes to the church at Colossae, he says, I joy and I rejoice when I behold your first order and faith. So God never puts his stamp of approval upon disorder. God has nothing against organization, by the way. The word for order there is the Greek phrase katatoxin, and it means according to rank and file. And God says that the thing that pleases him in the church is when everybody is in his right place, according to order, doing the thing that he's been given to do. So in the church as a body, you see the order. Christ as supreme, giving the directions, the members in relation to him and to one another, each one in their own place, doing their own thing at the right time in submission to the head. That picture then comes through when we look at the church as a body of which Jesus Christ is the head. However, there is also a picture of unity under fruitfulness in John chapter 15. So that there is a twofold portrait of unity in the scripture. Unity that is seen in the figure of the head and the body, a unity unto order, and unity which is seen in the vine and the branches, a unity under fruitfulness. One might ask, why doesn't God simplify the procedure and just give one picture of unity of the church in the Word of God, make it a great deal simpler? However, there are some things that you can see in one picture that you cannot see in another. In the picture of the head and the body, you see an order preserved of Christ over the body. But in the vine and the branches, you see a unity that portrays an inseparableness that you cannot see in the head and the body. When you look at a human body, you can envision separating the head from the body. But when you look at the kind of unity that we have with Jesus Christ in the vine and the branches, you see an inseparable kind of unity. Turn with me to John chapter 15 to look at this particular picture for a few moments. John chapter 15. You remember that this particular passage is in the upper room discourse. These are the instructions that the Lord is giving to his disciples in his last major set of instructions to them, just after he has given his final command to them that they are to exercise love one to another and thereby have a ministry to the entire world. And after stating that, the Lord gives them some of the bases upon which they're going to be able to exercise that kind of a supernatural demonstration. In John chapter 15, we read, I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he lifts up. And every branch that bears fruit, he cuts back in order that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing." If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. In this is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. 
And then skipping over to verse 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And whatever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you that you love one another. The picture of unity that is given to us in John 15 presents to us an individual relationship to Jesus Christ that we do not really see in the figure of the head and the body. There are two basic things that I want to stress out of the picture of the vine and the branches as a picture of the church. And the first of those is the essence of the relationship. That is, what kind of a union, what kind of a unity is it that the branch has with the vine. When Christ says, I am the vine, and you are the branches, what kind of a unity is it that he is speaking of there? Actually, it's more than a unity of life, though that is involved. In the head and the body, you have a unity of life. The life of the hand is the same life as the life of the head. So you have a unity of life there. But in the vine and the branches, Christ is portraying a unity of identification. If you'll think about this for a moment, I believe that it will be worth the exercise of thought. When he says, I am the vine, you are the branches, notice that he is not saying, I am the root and you are the branches. He is not saying, I am the trunk and you are the branches. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Now, how much does the vine include? It includes root, trunk, stem, branch, fruit, leaf. All that is there is the vine. So Christ is saying, I am all of it, and you are part of me. You cannot separate the branch from the vine. The branch is integrally related to the vine. You can't talk about the vine apart from the branch. The branch is part and parcel of the vine. So Christ in this figure portrays to us as close a union as you could possibly think of. I am the vine, you are the branches. Now, it was that particular thought that brought the dynamic change in Hudson Taylor's life in the midst of his missionary ministry overseas. If you have read any of the biographical works of Hudson Taylor, you remember that all of his life was not the victory that he had in the latter part of his life. The first years of his life as a missionary were years of great frustration. And on one particular occasion, he came to John 15, and when the truth of this passage got through to him. It wasn't the first time he'd read it, but it was the first time the truth of it had really gotten through to him. When it got through to him, it changed his life. It would be more impossible to separate a branch from the concept of vine than it would be to separate a cup of ink that had been dropped into the Pacific Ocean. The ink could be separated from that, but the branch could not, because when you speak of vine, you speak of branch. The two are experiencing a unity of identification so that I am identified with Christ. Some time ago, a book was written that became a classic called The Imitation of Christ by Thomas A. Kempis. There is a truth, undoubtedly, in that book, but I believe that there is not a full statement, really, of our responsibility and relationship to the Lord. For our responsibility is not first the imitation of Christ. Our responsibility is first to recognize our participation in Christ. And when I get a deep sense of my participation in Christ, then imitation of Christ will be a natural follow-up to that recognition. My basic job is not imitation. My basic understanding is participation. So that when Christ died on the cross, I died. When he was raised from the dead, I was raised unto newness of life. 
the life that he lived, I can live because of the identification that I have with him. So that when God looks at me today, he looks at me through Jesus Christ. And that's the only position he can see me in. He accepts me on no other basis. He accepts me on the basis of my identification with Jesus Christ. Therefore, I receive the same standing that the Lord has. The Lord is righteous, and I share His righteousness. His righteousness is my righteousness. That's the kind of identification that we have with the Lord. And so on an individual basis, the Lord wants us to understand not only our body relationship with Him, which preserves the order in unity, but He wants to preserve the identification of the believer with Him through this picture of the vine and the branches. That's the essence of the relationship. Now, that's not without purpose, for God intends that as we understand the essence of our relationship with Him, there will be forthcoming from us a life of fruitfulness. And that's the result of this relationship. So the result of the unity in the body is order. The result of the unity in the picture of the vine and the branches is fruitfulness as we understand these relationships. There are a couple of things that I would like to state with regard to this fruitfulness. In the passage before us in John chapter 15, you will notice something concerning the abundance and the assurance of fruit that there is for the believer's life. I was asked at one time to bring three messages on John chapter 15, and prior to that time I had the privilege of living for a week in a vineyard. And the man who was the owner of the vineyard was a man in his middle 80s, and he had had a lot of experience in this area. He grew up on the farm, and he knew all about grapes. And for a week, he took me around and showed me various kinds of grapes and how you trimmed, how you pruned the various kinds of grapes. I never dreamed there were so many grapes in all my life, and I never knew there were so many different ways of pruning them in order to assure yourself of the best kind of a crop in the succeeding year. Some of those grape vines were cut down vigorously. They would leave only a stump there with a knob on top of it, and there were no branches going out from it. And I wondered how they ever expected to have anything the next year. On other grapes, they would let a four-foot runner go on each side, and so each stump was eight feet from the other one, and a branch went out from one four feet, and a branch from the other four feet. And believe it or not, that little branch next year was going to produce a tremendous crop. On the other hand, there are some grape vines that spread out for blocks. In the uh, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, there is this statement concerning a grapevine there. It says, In Hampton Court, near London, there is a grapevine under glass. It is about 1,000 years old and has but one root, which is at least two feet thick. Some of the branches are 200 feet long. Because of skillful cutting, and pruning, the vine produces several tons, one vine, of grapes each year. Even though some of the smaller branches are 200 feet from the main stem, they bear much fruit because they are joined to the vine and allow the life of the vine to flow through them. The same kind of life that is being enjoyed by the branch right next to the stem is exactly the same kind of life that is being enjoyed by the branch 200 feet from the stem. The same kind of grapes that are being produced right next to the trunk are the same grapes that are being produced way at the end of the vine. It's the same life coursing through the entire vine. So that this passage would have us understand that when we realize our unity with Jesus Christ, which is a unity of identification, that will act as a mind renewer, Romans 12, 3, for us, and it will produce the transformed life which will allow the abundance of fruit. So that as he goes through this passage, he says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, 
he lifts up. And by the way, in your translations, you may have the words, he taketh away. Here's a good example of the translator not being a vine dresser, but a theologian. For if he were a vine dresser, he would never have translated it, he takes away. Any vine dresser has enough sense to know that that tender green branch that is coming out from the vine, if you come along and that which is not bearing fruit, you take it off, you're not going to have any grapes next year. You don't take that vine off, you lift it up. And that's the primary meaning of the word that is used here. It is not talking about chopping off, it is talking about lifting up. Actually, the word means to lift or to bear or to carry. Now, when you lift something up, Obviously, you have removed it from here to wherever you lifted it. And if you put it down someplace else, then you have taken it away. But that certainly is not the major meaning of the word. The major meaning of the word is simply to lift it up. And that's exactly what the vine dresser does. When he goes through those vineyards and the tender green shoots that are coming out, he does not cut them off because they're not bearing fruit. He doesn't expect fruit from them. He lifts them up so they won't be trampled underfoot and gets them under the wire and trains them in with the rest so that they will bear fruit. And that's exactly what he says, my father does here. And by the way, don't slip over the fact that it's my father who does that. Oftentimes we go through this passage and we see I am the true vine and say, yes, that's Christ and my father is the vine dresser, and we slip by that, and then every branch in me, and we're talking about us as the branches, and we forget who's doing the pruning. It's a source of real satisfaction to me to realize that my omniscient, omnipotent father is the one who does the cutting in my life. Nobody else has the pruning shears. He alone has them. And he knows exactly where to cut in order to bring the best kind of product in the forthcoming years. What a tremendous devotional possibility there is in that particular statement for my own life. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me, Christ says, that bears not fruit, he lifts it up. He does the natural thing that any vine dresser would do. And every branch that bears fruit, that is the one that has already had fruit, he cuts it back. He gets the woodiness off of it in order that it may bring forth more fruit. His goal, then, is more fruit in my life. Now, as you move through the passage, you'll notice that the progression is from fruit to more fruit to much fruit. And that's God's ordination. And that's not an uncertainty. That's a certainty. Therefore, he can say with certainty in verse 16, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. Now, by the way, that's not an exhortation. That's a statement of fact. One who knows Jesus Christ will go forth and bring forth fruit. That is the nature of a healthy vine. Grape vines produce grapes. That's just the way it is with a grape vine, just like apple trees produce apples. Apple trees don't work at producing apples. They just produce apples. I've never yet gone through an apple orchard and have seen a tree all of a sudden begin to go through all kinds of contortions and the limbs begin to groan and to grunt and all of a sudden, pooh, there's an apple. I've never seen that happen. Apples are the natural product of a healthy apple tree. Grapes are the natural product of a healthy grape vine. And so he says the normal thing that we can expect is productivity. And we can expect a tremendous productivity, a growing productivity, because grapes have a reputation for tremendous productivity. And God says we are going to have productivity. He said, I send you forth with that assurance because that's the only thing that grapevines are good for. Other kind of plants that God has made can be used for several things. Some trees can be used for shade, and they can be used for other products, and they can be used for wood, but grapevines can be used for nothing but productivity of grapes. And so God chose a figure of the believer in Christ that fits exactly what our job is. 
a believer is on earth for one thing, and that is basically fruit production. For fruit is going to glorify God, and it's going to enable the believer to enjoy his relationship. So a twofold benefit is going to be coming from that. The potential of the believer, the potential of the branch, is realized as the branch abides in the vine, as it finds its source of sustenance in the vine. Now let me make a suggestion with regard to fruit here. We sometimes use the term fruit a bit loosely. We tend to speak of fruit as people. Now basically the Bible does not use fruit as people. Fruit is defined very clearly in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And that love which is portrayed there as the fruit of the Spirit is also referred to in John 13, 34 and 35 when Jesus said, A new command I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you love one another. And by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one to another. The primary fruit of the believer is the love that he has for his brother in Christ. And the most infectious thing that you and I can do to whet the appetite of the world toward Jesus Christ is not to love them, but to love one another. Our basic responsibility is not to love the world. Our basic responsibility is to love one another and there is going to be such an infectious demonstration coming from that that people are going to see the kind of relationship that is begotten among believers and they are going to want to know that which made it possible. So it is the fruit of the Spirit that he is speaking of here and lest that poses a problem for you in taking away the idea that it refers to souls, let me simply elaborate this, that every good fruit has within it the seeds of reproduction. And if we are bearing the fruit of the Spirit of God, there will be in that fruit the seeds of reproduction which we have just expressed a moment ago. So God is saying... This is a kind of a relationship that you have with me, a unity that produces fruitfulness because of your understanding of your identification with me and the enjoyment of my life. Now let me conclude that particular picture with an illustration. The term abiding is used throughout John chapter 15, and this abiding of the branch in the vine is the key to the fruitfulness. I think, therefore, it is important for us to try to get through our minds what does it mean to abide in Christ? What does it mean to settle down in Him? This is not talking about that relationship that happened when I came to Christ as my Savior and received new life in Him and became a branch in the vine. He is not talking about becoming a branch in the vine here. He is talking about a branch abiding in the vine. Those are two quite different things. He is not talking about the initial union. He is talking about the subsequent communion. Now, how can we visualize that? Well, there was an experience that happened to me one time that has helped me to understand this particular relationship here of abiding. When I was serving as chaplain out here at Dallas Naval Air Station, I had a yeoman who was quite disconcerted that he had a chaplain that did not know how to swim, a chaplain in the Navy. That seemed like a contradiction to him. And so he said, Chaplain, I'd like to teach you how to swim sometime. So a particular Sunday afternoon came after the chapel service, and we went down for lunch. And I said, Wayne, this afternoon is the afternoon. We went down to the pool, and they've got a great big Olympic-sized pool out there at the air station. And he said, now, Chaplain, swimming is really easy to learn. So the reason most people can't swim is because they're afraid of the water. So one of the first things you've got to overcome is the fear of the water. And he said, what I'd like you to do, therefore, is just 
to lie down on the water and rest there. And that sounded very simple. And so I did exactly what he said. I went backward on the water and proceeded to go down to the bottom of the pool. And they pulled me out, and we all had a big laugh over it. Make a mistake any time, you know. Don't expect you to be perfect the first time. So he said, Chaplain, let's try it again. Just lie down on the water. I did exactly what he said, and I went down to the bottom again. Well, this went on for a number of times, and it was evident that we were losing our joy. And he was getting a little more irritated, and I was as well. Only he didn't dare show his irritation because he was a white hat and I was an officer. And he said, now, chaplain, all I want you to do is to lie down in the water. And I said, look, Wayne, I've been doing exactly what you've been saying. I've been trying to lie in the water, and every time I try to lie in it, I go down to the bottom. And he said, chaplain, and he was still smiling, but he was biting his teeth now. And he said, that's what's wrong with you. He said, I keep telling you to lie down on the water, and you keep trying to lie down on the water. Now will you stop trying to lie down on it and just lie down on it? <laughs> and I found that when I followed his instructions, I stayed on top of the water. There was a different kind of an attitude toward the water. Before, I was pressing my arms down in the water, nonsensically trying to hold myself up. And I was holding my head up out of the water to be sure that I didn't drown. And consequently, I went down. But when I really trusted the water, then I allowed my arms to float up on top of the water, and I allowed my head to go back on the water, and believe it or not, I floated. Now, I never learned how to swim very well, but I can sure float. It's a matter of your attitude and relationship to the water. Now, I don't know of any better way of explaining abiding in Christ. For if you're going to fight it, it'll frustrate you and you'll go down. But if you will trust the resources in Him, He will hold you up. If you hold yourself up, you'll go down. But if you'll trust the resources, they'll hold you up. Now, you can't trust resources that you don't know anything about. So your faith will only be as great as your understanding of God. If you have a small God, you'll have a weak, anemic faith and a weak demonstration of it. God says, I want you to understand your relationship to me. It's a relationship of unity a unity that preserves order where we see Christ as the one who gives all the directions, as the preeminent one. A relationship of unity which produces fruitfulness because of our understanding of our identification with him who is the source of all life. Now those are two pictures that portray for us the unity of the body of Christ. Now, the second two sacred snapshots of the church in the Word of God are the pictures of service seen in the high priest and the priesthood and the shepherd and the sheep. And it's in these two particular pictures where we'll see more of our relationships to our local church orientation. Remember, we stated right in the beginning that the reason for studying the universal aspect of the church is in order that we might understand the pattern that God has given for the local manifestation of that universal church. We study the universal in order to get the pattern for the local that we build in our geographical area. The two that give us most information for our local orientation are the picture of the high priest and the priesthood and the shepherd and the sheep. Let's turn then to the idea of the high priest and the priesthood and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13. The picture of the head and the body is seen primarily in Colossians and Ephesians and in Corinthians. The picture of the high priest and the priesthood is found particularly in Hebrews. And Hebrews, of course, is the New Testament counterpart of Leviticus. 
Interestingly enough, these two pictures, the high priest and the priesthood and the shepherd and the sheep, are seen together in Hebrews 13, 10 through 17. In 10 through 16, you see the believer priest image, and in verse 17, you see the shepherd and the sheep image. The church's service as a priesthood, twofold. Hebrews 13, we have an altar of which they have no right to eat who serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to share, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Now let me, in the beginning of the discussion of these two pictures, relate them one to the other. In the picture of the high priest and the priesthood, you have portrayed the individual believer's right to access to God, his independent access. In the picture of the shepherd and the sheep, Christ as the shepherd and we as the sheep, you have the picture of the believer's dependent submission on the shepherd and upon the other sheep. So the high priest and the priesthood picture portrays independency, and the shepherd and the sheep picture portrays dependency, the same kind of parallel that we had in the last two pictures. Now, the tendency is for us to get involved in one or the other of these and not keep them in balance. For example, in many of the lives of Christians who are not related to a local church, you will hear a statement like this, Oh, I don't need the local church. I don't need a pastor. I am a believer priest, and I have access to the Word of God and to the Christ of the Word, and I need no other person because, after all, there is no mediator between man and God save the man Christ Jesus, so that I, as a believer priest, need no one else. That is going to seed on the believer priest picture in the Word of God. On the other hand, there are those who, for example, are locked in to the Roman Catholic faith with the picture of the shepherd and the sheep. And the shepherd tends to become a dictator over his life. And the sheep are told that they have no right to interpret the Word of God. They may read the Word of God, but only the clergy can interpret the Word of God. For interpretation is not the province of the average member of the church, but of the clergy. That is taking the shepherd-sheep figure to an unbiblical extreme. Therefore, God gives us two pictures. And he says, on the one hand, you are a believer priest with independent access to God. On the other hand, you are a sheep that is to manifest his dependency and his submission to one another and to the under-shepherd, my pastor, who is in turn responsible to the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. Now with that in mind, let's look primarily to the believer as an independent believer priest. When these words of Hebrews, and specifically Hebrews 13, 10 and following, were presented to that Jewish Christian congregation in that day, I'm confident that it meant far more to them than it means to us today because we live in a different culture. We live in a culture where we are constantly exercising our free right as Christians to come to the Lord 
any time we want, as often as we want, from wherever we want. But no Jew, no faithful Jew, would have ever performed that kind of an exercise. In the Old Testament, there was one day, basically, when he came, and that was the Day of Atonement. There was one place, basically, that he came, and that was the tabernacle. There was one person, basically, who offered up an offering for the sins of the people, and that was the high priest. So the Old Testament believer in God had no concept of what is being spoken of in Hebrews, of an independent believer priest. It was for him the Day of Atonement when the high priest took before God an offering for the sins of all of the people, and that was the kind of understanding they had of their relationship with God. But as a result of the cross, as a result of the removing of the veil that stood between man and God in Christ Jesus, we have the one who allows us open access so that in Hebrews chapter 10, for example, he says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God. Or again, back in Hebrews chapter 4, he says to us, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted or tested like as we are, yet apart from sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That was a new kind of thinking for these Jewish Christians. That was something they had never practiced before, but was now available to them because of the way of initiation that Jesus Christ has made through the blood of the cross. So the writer to the Hebrews is opening up to them an entirely new truth. They were familiar with all of the ordinances of the Old Testament where the priest would have to go through the ceremonial cleansing of his own body. He would need to wash his body and he would need to wear certain kinds of garments and go through many kinds of ritual in order to make the approach to God. And why was all of that done? The reason for doing that was to cause people to understand that they were stepping into the presence of a holy and an awesome God. And they were a sinful people. And they needed to recognize that God could not stand to look upon sin. And therefore, they had to make meticulous preparation to come into the presence of God. The writer to the Hebrews then says, Jesus Christ has made that preparation for you. He went through the meticulous preparation of his own body. He was without sin. He knew no sin. He did no sin. He was apart from sin. And he having prepared himself, he having learned obedience through suffering, became the perfect sacrifice that could now make it possible that we could come boldly before the throne of grace. I trust that we shall not find ourselves trapped in that idea of taking for granted the privilege of prayer or treating lightly the awesome fact that it is for a sinful man to step into the presence of a holy God. I'm confident that I far too often underestimate what God is saying when he says, I have an altar and I have sacrifices and I can come right into the presence of God. It amazes me today that a far larger body of people on this earth than Christians probably pray to Allah far more than the average Christian. The faithful follower of the Muslim faith five times a day prostrates himself to the ground and faces toward Mecca and prays to Allah but Allah does not hear his prayer because he does not come through Jesus Christ. What a fantastic thing to recognize that I, 
when I come through Jesus Christ, reach heaven. And what a convicting thing it is to realize how little I take advantage of that opportunity. Someone has said, the tallest man in the world is the man who, when he is on his knees, reaches heaven. And that's you, if you know Jesus Christ. Now, what kind of sacrifices does God say that I, as an independent believer priest, have when I come to the throne of God? There are three that are mentioned in the Word of God. Let me just name them and briefly comment on them. The first one of them is mentioned in Romans chapter 12, the sacrifice of your person. We're not going to spend time on that, for I want to come right back here to Hebrews chapter 13. The other two sacrifices that the believer priest has that are mentioned in the Word of God are in verses 15 and 16 of Hebrews 13, where he says, By him, that is, through Jesus Christ, Therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to share, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. In Romans 12, you have the sacrifice of your person, your body, in Hebrews 13, 15, you have the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of your lips, giving thanks to his name. In verse 16, you have the sacrifice of your possessions, your material possessions that we may give unto God. And with these sacrifices, God is well pleased. To my understanding, those are the only three sacrifices that are mentioned in the New Testament that a believer priest has of his person or his physical body that he gives to God for service, of his praise, the fruit of his lips, and of his possessions, the material wherewithal that God has allowed him to amass to be used for God's glory. Let me briefly comment on the sacrifice of praise here in verse 15. I appreciated so much the exercise that we went through last evening with regard to Psalm 47 and then a time of praising God and not allowing any petition. I find that our praise vocabulary is usually rather slim and our petition vocabulary is very, very large. We decided one night in a prayer meeting at our church to bring some new life and vitality into the service. We were a little weary of the same prayers being prayed weekly with the same preambles to prayers, and some of us had become convinced that one could almost record them on one week and then simply play them back to God on a succeeding week, and we would not have to waste our time being present to utter the words because it was as mechanical as that. Therefore, we decided let's change this. And on one Wednesday evening at prayer meeting, we said, now tonight, all we will offer to God is praise. There will be no petition tonight. Tonight we'll ask for nothing. So as you stand to praise God, if you feel a petition coming on, then just sit down, forget it. And it was an interesting thing. There was no prayer that night that went beyond a minute in length. It's one way, by the way, to shorten your prayer time for certain individuals. And I recall one lady had prayed for just a few seconds, and then she began to get off onto a petition, and she caught herself. She said, I'm sorry, Lord, and she sat down. <laughs> when you start to praise God, when you start to exercise this believer-priest sacrifice, you probably will find that it's kind of hard to find much to say for a while. And I had that problem, and one pastor gave me this suggestion. He said, if you have a hard time praising God, I would suggest to you that you go back and simply pray the Psalms to the Lord. For the Psalms are full of praise. 
And I began doing that. And I found that, lo and behold, I was able to increase my praise vocabulary. For the Psalms reminded me of many things that I had to praise God for. I believe that when we go back and look at the promises in the Word of God, we'll have much to praise God for. When we look at the attributes of God in the Word of God, we will have much to praise God for. And so he says, through Jesus Christ, let us as believer priests offer the sacrifice of praise. Then he defines it as the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And the giving thanks here in Hebrews 13, 15 is the same word that you have in 1 John 1, 9 rendered confess. It's to say the same thing that God said. So he says, look at what God says about himself in the word of God. And then say the same thing that God says. And that will give you a praise vocabulary. The sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Now notice, he says this is a sacrifice. And I believe that a sacrifice is something that costs you something. And if the time you spend in prayer costs you nothing, I doubt that it's a sacrifice. Prayer is a believer priest sacrifice. It takes time. It takes energy. It is costly, but it is valuable because it changes things within the program and purpose and plan of God. I can't help but think of that verse in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 19 where Paul rejoices at the prayers of the Philippians on his behalf because he says, your prayers are saving me. Verse 19, for I know that this, that is, these problems he's having, shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So by means of of the throne room of God, I, as an individual believer, perhaps separated by miles from another believer, just as Philippi was separated from Rome, have the prerogative of being able to affect a change in a believer's life by using the opportunity that I have at the throne room of God. Now, if that isn't power, I don't know what is. Paul says, these problems that I'm having are turning to my salvation daily through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I cannot get around the fact that in the Word of God, believers are not exhorted to pray for the lost. They are exhorted to pray for the saved. And if believers will spend the time that they ought to be praying for the saved, then believers will be becoming what they ought to be and unbelievers will be getting saved. Paul says, since I heard of your salvation, since I heard of your faith, I haven't stopped praying for you. That's the time to begin praying when a believer comes into Jesus Christ. Now he is saying this is a privilege you have as an independent believer in the church of Jesus Christ. You have become a believer priest. You can offer the sacrifice of your person, your body. You can offer the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of your lips, confessing, giving thanks to his name. You can offer your material possessions unto God. And these things please God. These things, he says, are like a sweet fragrance going up into the nostrils of God. They smell good to God. May I encourage you to lead with your best smells. Do what the Avon lady does when she comes to your door. She does not lead with her worst smells. She leads with her best smells so that when she comes through the door, she has an aroma that precedes her. God says there is an aroma that can surround you and precede you. And that aroma will come 
as you exercise your prerogatives as a believer priest, the sacrifices that you have through Jesus Christ. What a privilege is prayer as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ.